The Rhode Island Natural History Survey presents videos to showcase the animals, plants, geology, and natural systems that surround us, and the people and organizations working to understand and conserve them. Welcome everybody to this uh, talk on citizen science in the information age with Professor Shoei Mitra. Uh, I'm David Gregg. I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Also helping on this call are Kyra Stillwell and Pete August. Um, I'd like to thank Kyra for all her work getting this uh, program organized. Normally she does our in-person programs, but she's done a great job of this Zoom program. And um, thanks to Kyra. And a special thanks to Pete August, for uh, who's on our board of directors, uh, and the Watch Hill Conservancy for helping us organize the Zoom uh, feature here today. So. Shoei will take questions at the end. So if you have questions, you can use the chat feature to send uh, your questions to me or to Pete August, and we will uh, relay those questions to Shoei at the end of the program. This talk was originally planned for April, and we were looking forward to an in-person program at the Quonset O Club. Um, you remember in-person gatherings? Uh, Shoei's talk was to mark the presentation of the surveys Distinguished Naturalist Award, Golden Eye Award. The three recipients of the Distinguished Naturalist Award this year, Ray Larson, Dick Farron, and posthumously Mary Jo Murray, were, are all icons in the birding world in Rhode Island. And we thought that this would be a great program to put together uh, with Shoei's talk. Uh, that's kind of the underlying logic of, of the program, which, which we had organized in April, but we've managed to recreate it um, today. We were also going to present our GoldenEye Awards. To, uh, it's an award to people who make extraordinary natural history discoveries, uh, as well as a new award that our board has instituted, the Founders Award for Extraordinary Service to the Natural History Survey. Even though COVID forced us to cancel the April event, we still wanted to recognize all the recipients in a special way. And so not only are we going ahead with this talk today, we video recorded presentations of the awards to the recipients a week ago. And we are editing that together into a video, which we will put up on our YouTube channel on Tuesday for hashtag Natural History Tuesday. Uh, this week, that video will be the video of the week. Ray Larson and Dick Farron have done extraordinary work to assemble data on Rhode Island's birds over the decades, supporting others' projects and getting involved in their own. Mary Jo Murray is best known for her weekly bird walks through which hundreds of Rhode Islanders were introduced to birding. Uh, in the recording, Mary Jo's award was accepted by her daughter, Joanne Sullivan. The Golden Eyes went to Suzanne Payton for discovering a new population of spadefoot toads in an unexpected place, which really changed our thinking about that species in the state. And also to Bill Sharkey, who's a businessman in, the, uh, in Ashaway, who had been watching um, five line skinks around his property for a couple of years and reported them to the survey this year, along with um, turning in a specimen, which was just extraordinary. In addition, we presented the first Founders Award for Extraordinary Service to the Sharp family, Peggy and Hank, and to Julie and Henry. Uh, all four have been instrumental in getting the Natural History Survey to where it is today. So a, a really worthy recipient of the first Founders Award for ex uh, Extraordinary Service. So um, all of that will be covered in the video that's coming out on Tuesday. Now, uh, many of you today are new to our organization. And so I thought I'd give you a, just a quick little background on the Natural History Survey. Uh, if you're familiar with Natural History Surveys in other states, you might think that uh, we are a state agency or a university program, and we are neither. The Natural History Survey in Rhode Island is a nonprofit membership organization. And I wanted to just thank the members uh, for their support. We don't have any other source of funds for programs than the membership. And even though our programs have been pivoted from in-person to 
video this year, uh, many of the costs still remain for my time and Kyra's time uh, for our pivoting our hardware and software to, to new stuff and um, mileage and, and lots of other expenses. And so again, I point you to our YouTube channel. Uh, that's where our energy that would have gone into public programs has been put largely. So take a look at our expeditions to Rhode Island video series and hopefully you'll find those interesting. Now, uh, if you're not a member, you can go to our website, rinhs.org, and click the Join button and become a member of the Natural History Survey. So to introduce today's speaker, I'll say Rhode Island is a small state, but it punches way above its weight in the um, birding universe. And our speaker today, Joey Mitra, is a well-known member of Rhode Island's Elite Birding Fellowship. He received a BA in biology from that Mount Olympus of birding, Cornell University in 1989, and a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago, where there are no slouches in the natural history department either. Um, he is an assistant professor of biology at the College of Staten Island with research interests in avian ecology, evolutionary, evolution, and conservation. Shoei isn't just hiding in an ivory tower. He is editor of the Kingbird, the quarterly journal of the New York State Ornithological Association, co-compiler of bird records for the New York City and Long Island region, chair of the Rhode Island Avian Record Committee, and co-compiler of the Southern Nassau County and Napa Tree, Rhode Island Christmas bird counts. So thank you, Shoei, for coming to speak to us today on the subject, citizen science in the information age improving the quality and usefulness of crowd-sourced data sets. And I will pitch the screen over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to, to speak to this group and uh, to see some, some uh, very uh, dear uh, names in the participants list here. It's very, uh, very um, exciting for me. So, um, this talk has, has evolved uh, over, over the last decade or so. And I've actually, I'm afraid that I'm reaching the point where my uh, grasp on the information age is kind of uh, slacking off a little bit. I'm losing, losing touch with the, uh, the cutting edge of technology. But you know, what I'm gonna be talking about is you know, how our interest in the natural world and our desire to contribute to knowledge about it and understand it, that some of those, those um, those sentiments and those motives are, are kind of universal and ageless. But even so, even if you really believe that you're doing things the same way that you always have, what I've noticed is that the technological changes that we're experiencing, um, they influence the, the, you know, not only, you know, how we go about things, but they influence the data themselves. So uh, I'm very interested in understanding uh, patterns of distribution and abundance of, of birds and other organisms. And I hope that, um, that these observations will be useful to this, uh, to this community. So in a lot of, um, a lot of what I'm going to, to speak about, I'm gonna be making a contrast between two ways of going out and sampling um, natural history data. And of course, I'm, I'm really gonna be talking mostly about birds, but a lot of it is applicable to other organisms as well. And the two sort of polar the ends of the continuum in, in, uh, in birding are sort of, uh, you know, chasing rarities, the excitement of seeing rare birds um, on the one hand, the, the competitive uh, game uh, dimension of, uh, of birding. And on the other hand, the uh, sort of patient collection of data in a comprehensive way, trying to, to, to extract scientifically useful data from bird observation. So uh, these are illustrated here in this first uh, slide with the uh, um, wood sandpiper found by Carlos Pedro at Marsh Meadows and, and some of its admirers during its, its stay um, at one end of the, uh, the, the birding continuum. And then the, uh, the stalwart uh, uh, participants in the Block Island Christmas count um, here uh, and uh, their efforts over, over many decades to chart the abundance and, and changes in abundance of, of common birds like song sparrows. Um, I, I am very pleased to be able to um, give this talk uh, partly in honor of one of my mentors who is uh, uh, Dick Farron, who's 
um, depicted here. There's Dick. And, uh, and really, I, I, um, in case you don't recognize me in my current phase of long hair, there's a picture of me uh, here in the middle um, <laughs> in a shorter haired uh, uh, phase. Um, though some of you might not have seen me uh, since it, it was uh, it was long and obviously not so gray many decades ago, but um, also uh, here are some other folks I just want to 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 recognize: uh, um, Chris Reithel and Jay Osinkowski, and uh, two of the best uh, birders in the state: uh, Sue Talbot and Dan Fenizia, and uh, Scott Cummings, who of course is a, um, a, a fixture in the Rhode Island. Um, natural history uh, world and and uh, and Bob Emerson, who's uh, somebody I've, I've learned a lot about birds from, uh, you know, for for decades and um, getting uh, um, the mentorship of his uh, of his father before him. And the other two um, recipients really um, exemplify these two themes of what makes birding so uh, fascinating. That it can it can really um, guide one's lifetime, and uh, um, Ray Larson, I, I've had the pleasure of doing one the one time I've been able to do the Newport Westport uh, Christmas bird count. I spent the day with Ray and um, and really uh, enjoyed his company and his perspective on things and his just careful, patient um, cataloging of. Uh, the numbers of, of, of common birds uh, at Napa Tree and, and uh, over at the Satchua Salt Marsh over decades really have, they, they prove something very um, interesting about it because even when you don't think that you're chasing rare birds, you're seeing things that, that are, 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 are special and very much related to a particular context. So, you know, what, what Ray has seen over the decades in terms of the changing relative status of Eastern and Western Willets in Rhode Island. Um, that's something uh, uh, I, I pause a, a moment to, to, to think about and I'll come back to that idea that what is rare now might not have been rare before and, uh, and you know, conversely, what people were very excited about in, you know, 1960, in some cases uh, have become very mundane uh, common species nowadays. And it all depends on local context. Um, uh, David mentioned uh, Mary Jo's um, status in our birding community through her, her you know, uh, um, introducing birding to, uh, to people on her, on her walks and being an emissary for, for birding to, to so many folks. When I first met her, I, can, I think I remember it, I think it was in Bob Conway's uh, house in Peacedale after a Christmas count and I was introduced as a young birder um, to this uh, newly arrived birder from upstate New York. And to me, what she was famous for, I couldn't believe it. She had actually seen the um, painted red start that was seen in Western New York State in 1980. Uh, so her claim to fame was having laid eyes upon that bird. And uh, little did I know that um, just shortly before this talk, I would be sitting on the Fire Island Hawk Watch platform with a few friends and we would get word that there was a painted red start in Brooklyn at Floyd Bennett Field. And it was, you know, getting dark already. It was almost four o'clock, but we uh, we raced over there, got uh, got through two counties and two boroughs of New York City, and and uh, were able to see uh, see our own uh, painted red start. And that I, I don't want to um, make it sound as though there there's um, a better or worse way of going birding. The excitement of rarities and and the patient cataloging of records are are two sides of of what. Um, motivate most of us. Uh, the talk is more about how can we get the most out of the data that we, uh, that we um, produce through our, our field efforts. And so again, an example of a species that was a continental mega rarity just 50 years ago, um, lesser blackback gull, and is now occurring in such numbers that uh, in my local area here on the south shore of Long Island, it often is the most abundant large gull, um, outnumbering herring gulls and, and great blackback gulls uh, um, locally and on, at, at certain times of year with flocks into the multi hundreds. Really um, just an amazing um, shift. And so now it's moved into the realm of patient cataloging. So the technology revolution that we're experiencing uh, has 
the most obvious way in which it's changed things is it's made it possible to uh, collect and slice and dice vast volumes of data that, that, that used to, um, were once not even really imaginable. But the properties of those data have also changed. And in some ways, it's a, a positive thing. And, and we're taking advantage of new tools in order to, to gather new kinds of data. But in other ways, the uh, properties of the data are changing um, in unintended ways and sometimes in negative ways. So the the, the four themes of, of, of data quality that, uh, that I'm going to go through, refer to um, in, in several different contexts here are A, the reliability of individual identifications of organisms, um, also the estimates of, of abundance and, and, uh, and frequency of occurrence, and then also the variance in those estimates. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the independence of, of data points. We've got these huge data sets, but um, there's a question of how independent the one data point is from, a, from another. The reliability of individual identifications is one of the things that um, sort of curmudgeonly uh, old time birders uh, complain about when they, they you know, look at uh, eBird and, and Facebook and, and other uh, social media platforms in which people are, are sharing their, their bird records. Um, but I'm gonna argue that, uh, that the misgivings of, of people about uh, um, how technology is affecting uh, identification quality is somewhat misplaced. It's more complicated than people might think. Um, and again, the way in which we estimate the frequency and abundance of, of organisms is being affected by, by these technological changes, but the biases come out sometimes in complicated ways that are, uh, are not what, what, uh, what people um, intuitively imagine. Variance in, in estimates is greatly, greatly increased, which is you know, sort of inevitable when you invite um, crowdsourcing and you, you really want the participation of as great a body of, of field observers as you can, as you can get. Um, but even so, it, it's being, uh, the variance is blowing up for reasons that, um, that I think could be controlled a little bit. And of course, when everybody knows where the exciting bird of the day is um, and flash mobs occur around, uh, around painted red starts and, and uh, white wing crossbills, the independence of data points um, is greatly reduced. So my you know, passion is, is bird study. So I'll mainly be talking about birds. But in many cases, um, I really do think that you'll, you'll be able to apply um, the general ideas to other kinds of organisms as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll instead of trying to uh, avoid it, I'll, I'll uh, break down and, and use the word birding over and over again. Birding with expectations is something which we can't avoid doing now in the information um, environment that we find ourselves in because we know what other people are seeing. Uh, and the way that we see ourselves uh, and our effort in space and time is really changed now that we have uh, GPSs and phones that know exactly where we are and are reporting our position and our movements to uh, eBird and other uh, uh, you know, powerful forces in the universe. Um, and taxonomy um, creeps into this, not only because technology is revamping our way of classifying the, um, the natural world, but it also, inter this uh, interacts with the, the, the sort of uh, um, web-enabled um, data entry devices that give you specific taxonomic options rather than letting um, birders and other naturalists kind of work it out themselves what, they, what level, taxonomic level they, they uh, think they're identifying. So I have a, a, a few uh, little screen captures uh, that I, I've, I've caught to just illustrate this theme of, it's really, really difficult to just go out and take a walk without knowing what's going on. I uh, don't have Twitter, I don't have Facebook. I avoid um, using alerts and, and uh, um, things like that. I, I found out about the 
um, common cuckoo in Johnston from uh, from a friend of mine who was in Cape May, New Jersey, and called me on the phone because uh, um, they had sleuthed it out somehow uh, through a through a, a, a chat group in Connecticut or, or 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 something. But the information is all around us, and it's just repeated and repeated, and um, it's very difficult. I find I, I speaking with younger birders or not younger birders, but people who are coming to birding more recently, um, I find that they really, really uh, struggle with the, uh, the idea of going out without uh, expectations, specific expectations of what they're trying to, to find. So let's start with um, the reliability of individual identifications. One of the, the, the early fears was that inviting large numbers of inexperienced people to contribute to the uh, natural history data set would invite lots of spurious records of, of rare things. And I'm gonna argue that the modern technological environment actually has achieved very much the opposite effect. We, um, for the rarest, uh, records, the documentation has never been better. The ambiguity has never been be uh, never been less. And um, the the very same friend in in Cape May who uh, who alerted me to the common cuckoo alerted me to the I think the second North American record of of gray headed gull, the first one north of Florida. Um, when he was working, this is Doug Gotchfeld. He was uh, working as an internship up at um, Hubbard Brook in New Hampshire. He was reviewing. Ebird records from Brooklyn in his spare time in New Hampshire and um, had set the filter tightly, which I had urged him not to, uh, for black headed gull, which is a, a rare but regular species. I told him, just set it at one so you don't have to review every single time a person reports a, a black headed gull. But he's very methodical. And uh, when a report of a black headed gull popped up at Coney Island, he actually dug into it, got photos, and the identity of the bird as a gray-headed gull from the southern hemisphere uh, came to light. At the same time, people have, I'm sure there are people in New York uh, birding who have seen the painted red start and who have seen the gray-headed gull, but are uh, a little shaky in their identification of common species. People, um, who are looking at things which they, uh, whose identities they already know, um, will sometimes not develop their their overall skills in as broad a way as they might otherwise. So the example I, I give here, I could easily um, find a, a, an example for for Rhode Island, but I I, I kept this Long Island example. Um, Lake Ronkonkoma is a sterile, ecologically barren declivity in the middle of suburban Long Island, and it does not have much to, uh, to brag about, but a pair of um, tundra swans were found there, and of course people responded. They, went to, they wanted to see this bird, which is um, rare in, in Rhode Island and, and on Long Island. Um, and these uh, birders made their best effort to, to identify what they were seeing, um, they're used to being aware that the common type of, of merganser on Long Island, uh, at least coastally, is the red-breasted merganser, and they didn't want to cause any waves, so they reported the, you know, 120 um, sawbills that were out there on Lake Ronkonkoma. Um, checklist after checklist reported them as red-breasted mergansers, which um, many of you will, will note are actually quite rare on inland freshwater bodies. And when I say inland, I, you know, people think I'm being cute when I'm talking about Long Island and Rhode Island, but even Warden's Pond, it's hard. You could go there many, many, many times as I have um, before you uh, find a, a red-breasted merganser on Tucker Pond or, or um, an inland freshwater pond in, in this region. So they had misidentified the common mergansers, which actually are common on that, uh, that, that large lake. You can see the, the red uh, dot right in the middle of Long Island here. That is a legitimate record of, um, or re represents legitimate records of common mergansers. But at the same time, if you look along the outer barrier beaches here in Queens and here in Nassau County and to here where my efforts are concentrated around the Fire Island Inlet, um, 
these records are spurious. Almost all of them are, these are records of common mergansers reported by, by naively by, um, by people who are misidentifying red-breasted mergansers. So the, the overall picture of the status distribution, relative abundance of these two common birds on Long Island are hopelessly muddled. Um, and it's that kind of thing. It's, it's, the, the, uh, it's the common species, which are the ones that are most vulnerable to, um, to data quality problems. And the biases are, are, um, are complicated. So, so I, I did see the participant screen here. I, I'm not sure. I know some people who are in this uh, talk did come down to look for the bird on the bottom right here, photographed by um, my friend, Sean Syme. Um, I'm not sure how many folks actually were able to see it. I, it was, um, it's a corn crake. It's a European bird that is um, diminishing in abundance in its native range and which has occurred in Rhode Island. The, uh, the famous uh, um, 19th century collector, Newton Dexter uh, collected one um, in 1857 in Rhode Island. Um, this, uh, this species is so rare that um, when our friends found it right down here at Fire Island Inlet um, uh, three years ago, uh, it caused a, a, a sensation. And I, so for the competitive uh, um, listing birders, uh, which I do count myself at least partly uh, um, uh, uh, among um, us all, um, it may uh, give you uh, chills down your spine to think of me doing this, but earlier today I went in and I deleted my own record of corn crake from eBird. The reason I did it was I wanted to be able to use the eBird needs um, feature to, uh, to see what are the most likely species for me to add to my Suffolk County, New York list. Um, I've seen uh, about something a little over 380 species in Suffolk County. And you can see that these are the most likely, according to eBird, the most likely species for me to be able to add. Though of course, corn crake is a, a fake because I did uh, see the bird. Um, but I, I, I offer this to you to show you just how um, distorted the um, impression of relative frequency can be when everybody is doing the same thing out there. Among these birds, barred owls only occur in Suffolk County in a small um, population on Fishers Island, closer to Rhode Island and Connecticut than, than to, to most of Long Island. Um, rough grouse is extirpated. Um, real Egyptian goose is not even a wild bird. Uh, among the, the, um, the things that are my targets for Suffolk County, the most reasonable ones for me to hope to see over the next few years as rare birds are things like Brewer's Blackbird, um, White-Winged Dove, and, um, and Mississippi Kite. Any one of those would be a very reasonable rare bird for me to hope to find myself or one of my friends to find and, and go chase after. But Corncrake, a single individual bird um, that was present for only two days uh, has generated so many um, uh, records uh, that it actually shows up as being the second most likely species um, for me to be able to add based on a vast amount of data, almost 200,000 complete checklists. And of those, you know, um, 0 .0, at the time of the record, it was actually um, about 0.1%, one in a thousand um, uh, valid uh, eligible uh, checklist from Suffolk County actually included that bird. So the estimates of frequency and abundance of rare species, their identities are, are, are more sure than ever, but our estimates of their frequency and abundance are strongly biased upwards. Common species, on the other hand, um, are often uh, estimated, underestimated, and there are odd kinds of distortions that, uh, that appear in, in their data sets. So it's very, very obvious when, when you look at samples of, of uh, observations. And, and one of the brilliant, brilliant insights and contributions that Ebert contributed to field ornithology was taking the checklist 
the complete sample of all species seen and their numbers um, as the unit of, of uh, data collection, as opposed to the line item species and, and uh, number, which was always in the past the, the unit of, uh, of data collection. Because when you, when you look at the checklist, the, the set of species and their abundances that an observer um, detects in a given effort, the, um, the conditional probabilities of finding one species if another one is present or absent, those things are extremely, extremely useful kinds of, of, uh, of data. Um, when you compare the samples collected by people who are deliberately trying to see a particular rare bird and you compare their, their samples to those of people who are, uh, who are out there for other reasons, sort of um, in the, the Ray Larson mode of, of counting every, uh, every shorebird, um, they're very, very different. The, the, the mean number of species, the variance in the numbers of species, the um, degree of overlap um, from one sample to another, all of these things are, are, are greatly, greatly affected by the motive of the, the person collecting the data. So um, here's a typical one. A, a person wanted to see the wood sandpiper. They, they reported their sample as not being a complete checklist because that's honest. They, they weren't really there to, to count greater yellow legs. Um, on the left. And then I just dug this up for old time's sake uh, um, from um, 30 years earlier. Uh, um, my own um, visit, one of my early visits to that very site um, when I didn't collect data on all the species that I saw, but I think I collected data on all of the herons that I, I saw at uh, Whedon Lane and, and Marsh Meadows uh, back on that day. Um, and I will, I'll just make a, a mention, I see my mom in the, the audience. This um, is the day after we had, uh, she had taken me up to Nantucket to see the uh, Western Reef Heron um, there. And we stopped by uh, Whedon Lane on the, on the, the way back home. So that, uh, just an example to, uh, it was, uh, you know, craven chasing of rare birds that, uh, that intersected with collecting some interesting data on cattle egress, which have, um, really taken a, a, a nosedive in abundance since then. Uh, one more thing I, I wanted to mention, I, I removed it because I didn't want to um, incriminate people uh, too much or to, to, to be too uh, um, um, bossy about it, but there are any number of single species checklists from late October at Marsh Meadows listing just one wood sandpiper and when they are asked the question, are you submitting a complete checklist of all the birds you were able to identify? The answer is yes. And so that tells you about the, um, the, just how open or not open to detection of common uh, species people can be when they're in the thrall of a rare bird. So the variance in, um, estimates of species richness, the species totals of samples is just vastly increased when people are, are birding with expectations. Um, the variance in their detection rate uh, is greatly um, reduced for rare species because people chasing um, rare species are likely to persist until they find the target and then stop. Um, and if they fail to find it, they don't report. So, uh, so there's uh, um, remarkably little variance in detection rate for the target birds, but it's vastly blown up for all the common birds that are um, around the, uh, the environment of a, of a target bird. And the independence of data points is obviously just, just greatly, greatly reduced. There are these hundreds of thousands of samples that are being taken, but the actual number of independent samples is far smaller than, than that. And I'd like to talk about the, um, the phenomenon of the second rarest bird. So some of you will remember uh, back in November of uh, 1998, um, there was a long-billed merlet, an Asian uh, shorebird uh, off of Narragansett Pier that was um, you know, very much sought after by, by, by birders. Um, whenever people are gathered to look for a rare bird, there has to be some other bird there that is somewhat unusual in context. I call that the second rarest bird. And in that case, there happened to be a ring-billed gull, which is not a rare bird, but one with um, unusual uh, um, leucistic uh, pigmentation in its wingtip. And so it was being misidentified as, a, as an Iceland gull. 
and uh, report it over and over and over again. So th this is an example where you don't have to just be talking about birds. You can see it in other contexts where if everybody goes to the same spot to see a Hessel's hair streak, there, there's got to be some species of insect or plant in that particular Atlantic white cedar swamp that is rare but present there and um, you know overrepresented there compared to other Atlantic white cedar swamps. And everybody is going to see that plant or that insect when they uh, go to the the uh, um, quote unquote the place to to see the target organism. So the, the next um, theme is the way in which we see ourselves in space and time, precision, spatial precision, temporal precision, how we record what we're actually doing in the, in the field. And this has impacts on data quality in all of the, the ways that, um, most of the ways that we just discussed. So here's the uh, typical shotgun sh um, blast uh, um, appearance of the, the samples for the wood sandpiper in, in Jamestown. Um, some of the, that is reflecting actual people methodically plotting the position in which they saw the bird. Um, other ones are just sloppiness. Other ones are hard to explain. I don't know why there are these, these larger um, symbols are hotspots. So these are shared um, areas. And to me, it seems having four of them in such a small area is excessive. I think you could get away with maybe two um, to adequately express the the uh, the habitat variations um, at this uh, at this site. So it really is a um, something you have to decide what to do. How do you? Where do you plot where you were collecting data? And um, when do you start the clock? When do you you um, close out the the effort in terms of time? The, the trend, and this is driven often at times not by a conscious decision regarding the quality of the data or, or the goals of, of the, uh, um, the, the data collection, often simply being driven by the device that you're using in order to, to, um, to record your data. The social trend is to pro absolutely pinpoint precisely plot your position and to do it for short little bursts of, of uh, effort when you're actually encountering the organisms. And many uh, of, of the, the organizations that are cultivating crowdsourced data sets um, concur with this. They want as precise a, a plot as possible and a nice discrete uh, short duration, not a, not a, 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 a rambling uh, walk around, uh, around Trust and Pond. And I argue that this is fine if the observers actually are committed to conducting point counts and are going to um, do their transects or their point counts in a systematic way, or they're going to choose randomized places to go and record what they see in a particular amount of time. But most observers aren't really uh, committed to doing that. They don't want to do that. Um, and what can happen is people will wander around doing their normal routine, which could be actually plotted in a, 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 natural, a natural way over a longer duration, but they won't begin their, their sample until they find something that they perceive as uh, unusual enough to be interesting. And then if they wind up never seeing anything interesting or rare that day, they might not even bother to, to uh, collect a, a sample. And that obviously, um, is going to have a strong, strong um, effect. It's going to make rare birds seem much easier to find than they really are, because all of those walks on the beach when you did not see a snowy owl are left out of the data set, and the um, mile and a half that you walked before you finally turned the corner and there it was, and then you start your, your checklist uh, right there um, with your uh, mobile app, um, that greatly, greatly underestimates the, the amount of time and distance that you, you covered and overestimates the, um, the abundance and, and uh, frequency of the, uh, of the target species. Some of you will recognize this uh, mecca of, of birding. Um, this is Cape May Point, um, where some of the very, very most skilled 
um, field ornithologists in the in the world live and and have uh, taught us a lot about um, about bird migration and bird how bird distributions change over time, and yet they really overdo it. So at Cape May Point, which is you know a pretty defined place, they have hotspot separate public um, shared. Uh, locality pins for every single dune crossing, which, you know, is a little bit, uh, a little bit excessive. So the third um, area is taxonomy. And this is really uh, something that has interested me a lot. Um, and it's, again, it's not just that technology has given us th these, you know, vast, um, uh, molecular uh, um, genetic data sets, which have given us much, much better phylogenies and better understanding of the relationships among organisms. But it is the, um, the taxonomic conventions used by birders are being shaped um, by their devices in ways that they're not always consciously aware of. And once again, these, uh, these subtle um, aspects of, of the way that uh, our our information age is, is affecting our, our behavior can have uh, undesirable effects um, on, on data quality. In theory, the identification process should, should dictate the level of precision that a, a birder uses, whether you um, can't identify the impidinax flycatcher to species or species versus a subspecies, et cetera. Um, and this, I understand, is in many cases um, very bird specific because at least the subspecies issue is because in, it's really the mobility of birds that makes it likely that we'll have multiple subspecies of a given species co-occurring in the same place at the same time in the non-breeding season. But um, for other fields, you know, in, in um, entomology and other, other areas, um, taxonomic levels above the species level are often used. And, and people um, spend a lot of time becoming uh, um, experienced enough to decide what level to use when reporting what they're, what they're seeing. So uh, one of the, the um, citizen science uh, projects that I have been most committed to, it's really shaped my life in many, in many ways is the, the Christmas bird counts. I've, I've uh, been doing them since, uh, you know, I was first uh, um, allowed to, to join and, and, uh, and tag along with um, Bob Conway and then with Chris Reithel and, and Rick Anser back in the early 80s. And I, I've been absolutely committed to, uh, to doing these things. I find it fascinating to, to cover the same area over, over decades. Um, I've done, you know, maybe, I don't know, 130 or more uh, individual CBCs over the, over the years now. Um, but here's an example of just a taxonomic glitch, which uh, should be fairly obvious. This is the Southern Nassau County uh, Christmas bird count, um, and which, is, which uh, Pat and I are, are, have been compiling for, for many years now. And what is wrong here with the transition from 1947 to 1948 in the abundance of American crow? Were there no American crows uh, prior to, uh, to 1948? Um, and why was it that um, prior to then, they were apparently unable to identify the crows that they were seeing, you know, uh, scores or hundreds of down, down here, all these crow species. And of course, the reason is that the, um, the checklist or the, the template that was mailed out to them probably in, the, in those days um, probably changed from crow to American crow. And that was uh, before that time, they had always called their crows crows, their American crows crows. And a fish crow was rare enough that uh, everybody knew what you were talking about when you had to claim and, and uh, um, document and, and justify your, your, uh, your report of one. Um, so this is an unremedied problem in the CBC data set. So if, beware if you're doing an analysis of American crow abundance, um, you're, depending on, uh, uh, on whether people have retro 
corrected um, these data sets, they're, they're, they're full of uh, taxonomic glitches like this that arise from digital data entry. It never would be an issue if you um, were recording it in your notebook and you could always go back and figure out what was going on. This is from our friend Manny Levine who um, birded that area for, for many, many decades and compiled the count before handing it over to, uh, to Pat and me. So he had a good day on the 8th of February, 1946. And uh, a whole bell's grebe by any other name is what it is uh, out at Reese Park. And we would now recognize it as being a redneck reeb, uh, the lumped together with the European um, uh, form. Um, we don't have any ambiguity about whether the gannets that he was seeing were Australasian gannets or, uh, uh, or the metal larks he was seeing um, without uh, any greater specification, whether they might have been um, somehow Western metal arcs. We know exactly what, what he was recording. Um, and I'll just point out one other thing. I, I've noticed um, with um, live digital data entry, if you make a typo, it's unrecoverable. There's no way to ever go back and see that you click the rock, wrong box if both um, the wrong thing and what you intended to click are both plausible things that you could have seen. Um, whereas when you do record things in an analog fashion, you can really encode a lot of information very, very easily. So one of the things I love, I just love about this, um, about this uh, um, page from Manny's notebook is that five gannets to them at that time was very notable. Whereas uh, three canvasbacks was utterly not notable. Um, Jeer Falcon, okay, that's, you know, that's always, but the two rough-legged hawks did not merit the, the red line underneath. Um, so things have changed since then. Canvasbacks and rough-legged hawks are, are, uh, are a lot less frequent now than they used to be. Gannets have become really super, super common. And except for a, a couple of years ago, um, seeing nine snowy owls in, in one area in one day was, uh, would be pretty um, incomprehensible uh, nowadays. And just thinking this through um, from my own uh, um, records, I, I keep things in, a, in an analog fashion. It's very convoluted and tightly coded and uh, probably not making a lot of sense to, to most of you, but I'll draw your attention to this line. This is from a field trip to uh, southwestern New Mexico. And this four-letter code stands for solitary vireo. Um, and if I had not recorded it to the best of my abilities to subspecies, noting that it was a plumbious uh, subspecies of the solitary vireo um, at that time, I would be left in an awkward position now that they've split solitary vireo into three species. Cassins, Plumbius, and, and blue-headed, the common species in the, in the east. Um, but because I recorded things as best I could um, and not using a, a, a blunt instrument like, a, like a, 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 an online checklist, um, I preserved enough information that I know what I was looking at there. And I still don't know what I was looking at here in, for this tanager, um, whether it was a hepatic or a summer, what was it? We'll never know. Karanga spot. So I'm, I'm going to dive in here a little bit uh, deeply into the um, taxonomy and identification of, of birds for just a few uh, slides. But the, um, the main idea here is I, I really think that, that uh, naturalists should use the criterion of field identifiability and you have to use the criterion of probability when we record what we uh, see. And sometimes we're not gonna be able to, to get it down to the species level. Um, we're gonna have to deal with spuds as they're called or slashes when you get it down to two um, cryptic uh, um, species. Um, sometimes you are able to identify things even below the species level. And when should you do this? Is there, there, there can't be a single rule. It's got to depend on a bunch of different criteria. And my argument is that using probability at the level of subspecies in birds is not in theory different 
from using it above the species level when we don't see enough to identify a particular individual bird. So if you have a poorly seen chickadee or you don't hear it call um, and you're roaming around in, in West Greenwich or something, um, you're, you're not gonna call it a chickadee spot um, because there never has been a, a Carolina chickadee um, or a willow tit in, uh, in Rhode Island. So I think it's everybody would agree that it's fair to call those uh, those those not not critically identified chickadees black cap chickadees, um, but what about below the species level when we get to um, to subspecies? What we have to recognize is that the ease of field identification varies greatly from from one group uh, to another. Some things are extremely difficult. Some are are intermediate. Some are are easy, and this gradation actually exists at various taxonomic levels in birds. Above the species level, there are examples of groups of species that are difficult to, uh, to distinguish from each other. Um, there are plenty of species that are difficult to um, distinguish from each other. And of course, um, most subspecies are, are hard to identify in the field. But there are examples of, uh, of subspecies that co-occur and are relatively easy to distinguish. So I just mentioned co-occurrence. And again, this is really a, a bird thing when we're talking below the species level, um, because many, many um, birds have more than one geographic form that will occur in a given place in the non-breeding season. Um, so what we, we need to take that into account as well. Some um, groups of, of conspecific uh, um, subspecies occur together all the time, every 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 season. Others, the uh, likelihood is is less likely, but it's always a possibility out there. And then some are almost so unlikely that you you don't really need to to consider it. There's never been a proven red shafted flicker on the east coast of North America, um, so I, I consider that to be a, a really really um, low probability to to uh, consider in my uh, decision making process. And of course, uh, these two variables that I was just describing, field identifiability and probability of co-occurrence, they interact with each other. So there isn't a simple rule about when to use subspecies and when to use full species. But you'll get where I'm going when I say that if you can, you really should try to identify all the willets that you see because they are identifiable and they, they both do um, occur. And at this extreme, where probability of, of co-occurrence is so um, unlikely and the ease, they're, they're basically impossible to distinguish from each other, that's another area where you, you really, it almost um, becomes, the simplicity almost speaks for itself there. So an example I'd like to give is to take a, 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 an abundant bird like, uh, like Brant and imagine seeing a, a flock of a, that you estimate at about a, a thousand birds. And you, you're looking for rarities, but you're also collecting data. So you look at them carefully and the first 100 birds you put your scope on are definitely the um, Atlantic uh, Eastern uh, um, High Arctic breeding subspecies Hrota and then your heart stops and then starts pounding because you find the rare black brant that you've been looking for. And of course you start photographing it, you neglect the other 900 birds and um, you document your, your black brant. And how the question is how should you report your effort? Um, I did not fix the top of this slide here, I see, but so we're, we're back in, in uh, Bristol with a thousand uh, br uh, brant, not, uh, not in Jamaica Bay. And we've uh, sampled 10% um, of them carefully. And this is a, a frequent, frequent, frequent thing that you'll see on eBird. The rarity is identified, the scrutinized um, common expected uh, form is broken out by the actual number that were that were studied, and then the rest are left as unidentified um, to subspecies. But I argue that this is an inaccurate way to, to do it because you're misrepresenting your best estimate of the number 
of Atlantic brant that are that are present. Of those remaining um, 900 birds that are uh, that were not scrutinized, you know that the maximum number of rare taxa that could be among them is much less than the error around um, around your estimate of the the, uh, the the total number. So it would be better to report it as one black brant and um, and a thousand uh, Atlantic brant in our original example. Thank you. An exception to this rule that you should not report both the, the more inclusive uh, unidentified brant um, and the common expected subspecies in the same sample would be if you actually did see an, a, an additional ambiguous looking bird that was not a black brant but did not appear to be uh, a regular Atlantic brant. Maybe this is a gray belly brant from the Western high Arctic of, of, uh, of, of Canada. And in that case, since you're not sure of its identity, um, you're sure that it's a brand, but you're not sure of its subspecies identity, it's, um, it's appropriate to, uh, to include that as the generic species level um, brand. And of course, with copious notes and um, disclaimers and photographs and, and so on and so forth. But the best estimate of Hroda, the Atlantic brand in your sample, would be the total um, number, the, the, the size of the flock is, as you best estimated it. So okay, I, I think that we've um, talked about this from the point of view of, of, of looking for rarities and the excitement that comes from that. Um, and from the point of view of the really sincere desire that, that most people have to contribute to knowledge of, of natural history. They really want to contribute to our understanding of the abundance and distribution of, of, uh, of, of wild um, populations. Um, but the important thing is that the records that we collect, they, they cannot help but reflect aspects of ourselves and our motives and our skills and our, our uh, um, our, our prejudices in, in, in some ways. And they're most interpretable when we take that into account in the way that we record the data. And so this is my, my big um, argument. My argument is that whatever your habits are, they're not, um, shouldn't be viewed as being either good or bad, but they should be matched with the way that you collect your data and your data should reflect your experience, your habit, your predisposition, and, um, and, and really your, your goals. I was lucky to have um, a lot of uh, uh, excellent mentors, se several of whom I've, I've mentioned already. Um, I pulled out these um, notebooks from the, uh, from the early 80s and uh, reminded me of, of, uh, of early uh, um, days learning good habits of, of, uh, of data collection when I was being taught about um, uh, birding and, and natural history by Bill McEnany at South Kingstown High School. And I, I, so when, when, um, when David mentioned that uh, Rhode Island uh, punches above its weight, South Kingstown High School punches above its weight, I see uh, Chris Noons, also an alumnus of, 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 uh, of, of that school is, uh, is, is a participant uh, here tonight. And of course, the, the biggest caution I can give about chasing rare birds, effort directed at previously reported organisms, is that the data that are gonna come from it inescapably have certain types of, of, of flaws. And we can get around that if we take care to um, make our choices in, in ways that reflect our actual um, our actual patterns of, of data collection. So I, I can write my effort protocol for a typical day in the morning in the Great Swamp um, without even uh, thinking about it. I know I typically would be, get in there at 5 a.m. I'd uh, travel five miles. I would uh, be there for, for about four hours. Um, sometimes it would be a little different, um, but um, the, the unit of effort is, 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 is pretty, uh, pretty standard for me in, in that case 
might not be the same for everybody. But whatever your, your habits are, you should designate your sites and choose your effort protocols to reflect um, how you actually are out there um, in the field. Choose to report birds at the taxonomic level that really reflects what you're doing when you're identifying um, what you're seeing. Avoid using overly precise site designations and very short sampling durations, if, unless that is absolutely specifically what you had in mind um, to begin with, because otherwise you're going to um, inflate your estimates of, of how um, easily uh, uh, found um, rare species are. And one of the most important points here is that when I talk about the interpretability of, of data and the usefulness of, of data, um, usually people are kind of imagining that there's, you know, there, there are these uh, folks um, up there in the lab of ornithology at, at Cornell and um, behind, uh, behind closed doors with a supercomputer and, and cranking out these, um, these amazing uh, um, uh, GIS analyses of, of, of millions of data points. Um, that's not the only sort of usefulness that's, that crowdsource data has. Uh, it really is meaningful to oneself, most of all, first and foremost, and also to one's friends who we, um, we compete with, that we torture, we, we, uh, we help to find and, uh, things that, uh, that they're looking for, that we mentor. Um, the meaningfulness of one's data is much, much, it's much richer if you actually encode it in, in ways that, um, that are true to your own um, habits and your own uh, goals and, and motivations. So get, get out there in the field and collect the data, add it to, to the, the vast amount of information that, um, that we're, we're all, uh, um, enjoying and plagued by it at the at the same time, and resist um, you resist the urge to to uh, bird with expectations too often. But of course, I, I uh, never say never. All things in moderation. Um, I do it all the time. But when I do, I'm careful to recognize the limitations in in what I'm collecting in those contexts. And you can use the the appropriate protocol not to overrepresent the independence of your 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 effort um, and you can admit that maybe you were not looking at all the different species that were that were around you um, when you were looking at that rare bird and then don't uh, don't do it too much so uh, that's it for the for the slides um, thanks again for the opportunity to, to share these uh, these thoughts with with you and and you um, the, uh, the natural history community of Rhode Island. And uh, if David has um, collected any questions, we can uh, I'd be happy to, uh, to, to answer them. Sure, um, Shoei, uh, two things. If you unshare your screen, we'll get a bigger picture of you. And also if you could turn on a light in your room. Yes. That would be great. And then everybody else, if you have, uh, if you have questions, uh, you can send them in the chat and um, we will pose them as best we can. Um, some of the, I'll, I'll have to paraphrase some of the more complicated questions. Um, uh, so the first, I guess the first question, because I'm in charge, I get to start with the first question. Um, so your talk put me in mind of a study that Gary Alt did on deer hunters in Pennsylvania. And when he spoke at the survey, he talked about this. Uh, he actually put radio collars on hunters and learned that there were really different behaviors of hunters uh, in seeking deer by gen in, in generations. Younger hunters behave differently than older hunters. And so are there, if you're looking at all the variables that are changing over the course of time in birding, are there changes in the range and endurance of birders that are affecting the data they collect or, or perhaps in the, the quality of binoculars and telescopes or some other 
factor that trends over time. Uh, absolutely, no, really, really, um, there are remarkable uh, contrasts that you can you can see in the demographics. There are a lot of demographic uh, um, aspects to it, and one of the the, the things that I um, I emphasize when I'm birding with uh, other people and uh, who are newer to it and uh, who are who are learning um, is that everybody is different, and what I really do notice a difference between new birders who take it up in their their childhood you know as as, as very young people um, compared to newer birders who are coming to birding later in in life and I would emphasize that most of the cautions that I'm I'm giving here are most um, directed towards that second group the the the, the people who are, are growing up as digital natives and coming into birding as young people today, what, what they're, they're really able to match that, that sort of idealized vision of taking the new tools and applying them to old problems and, and doing it uh, in, a, in a sort of seamless way without distorting what the, what the ultimate goal is. But what I, what I uh, so for instance, when, when um, young birders get good at, at uh, recording their, their, their data um, in eBird, they often do use these very um, spatially explicit positions and, and short durations, and they do so accurately. And, they, and they're, they're willing to report all of their, their uh, fruitless efforts that, that they do. So they have all these, these short samples that didn't produce any rare bird and so on. So that they do it right. Uh, um, what, I, what I find is that the uh, folks who come to it um, um, later in life who, who weren't birding before the, the information age, uh, it's, it's, they're um, in a position where they sometimes have difficulties in meshing their interests and their goals with the, the technology that, uh, that, that, and the opportunities to use technology that they have. Right. Um, so another sort of methodological question that we had in the chat was about your, uh, your, your corn crake problem. And is and, and really sort of pointing out, isn't that a problem of the methodology uh, of eBird in producing those uh, percentages? If you were to if you were to report the percentages by you know the chance in any given day rather than you know on any given I don't know walk or what have you, um, it would change the way that those are reported. And that, so, that's right. So so how can your critique be used to um, advance the way we're doing things uh, in, in all of this? Well, so that, that's, um, it's very true. And of course I chose sort of the most extreme thing I could, I could think of to, to illustrate that, that, um, that example. Um, but it, it actually, it really is more complicated than that. And I'm sure that there are ways in which um, the, you know, the, the, uh, eBird Central, um, they do have methods of, of, of sort of correcting for, for the uh, non-independence of data um, in their analyses. But what I, I want to, I didn't say it in that particular part of the talk, but really one of my biggest goals is to have individual birders be able to interpret their own records better and understand the relative rarity of their, of their own um, uh, observations. And so one of the things that we observe, we old timers who've been doing this uh, for a long time, is that because of the, the ubiquity of information about rare birds, um, newer birders often don't have a sense of, of perspective on something as rare as a corn crake versus something rare, but really expected like a Western kingbird or a lark sparrow or, or, or something like that whenever something which they haven't seen before or haven't seen that year is reported, they go and chase it um, anyway. And what, th what this produces is a, um, a pattern in the data, but also in people's perceptions where they don't distinguish between the, the super rare and the merely rare, um, but really something that you're going to get to know if you uh, slog it out for, for a, a few years and, and, uh, and, and get out there. So the, the example of, of uh, like a, a lark sparrow is, is maybe um, one of the, my, my favorite ones 
because I showed you on the map where I spend almost all my, my free time, which is around Fire Island Inlet, Robert Moses State Park and Cedar Beach and Oak Beach and places like that. It happens to be one of the best places in Eastern North America to see lark sparrows, which is a rare um, migrant from, from Western North America. So I see them every year. I find them. I don't ch necessarily chase after ones that other, other people um, see. And so what you were suggesting, you know, using some sort of a, um, you know, a granularity uh, 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 filter, to, that would actually not work because I actually do find lark sparrows over and over again in the same place, you know, a different one there tomorrow than I did today, uh, um, uh, that sort of thing. So it, it really comes down to um, a question of, you, you know, recording your effort and making it clear that, uh, you know, yesterday's lark sparrow is different than today's lark sparrow for, uh, for, for lack of a better way of expressing it. Um, the other side of it is, yes, it, it, certainly it, it is true that um, there are things that eBird could do to solve that problem in terms of that particular uh, feature and their, their output. Um, but at the, at, at the same time, I really do wonder whether a, a lot of um, newer birders have a natural sense of like how shocking it is that I could see over 25 years 384 species of birds in, in Suffolk County and still never have seen a Mississippi kite. I mean, that to me, that's like almost mind boggling given how they, are, they show up in Connecticut, Rhode Island every year, but they don't show up on, on Eastern Long Island for, for reasons that nobody, nobody can explain. But that is like a, a real, real uh, conundrum. And the eBird data, there's just simply no way to express that sort of angle like this bird is not rare really it's not that rare but yet it's so extraordinarily difficult to find in this particular context right um uh, another question that's related to uh that we have that's related to maybe the bigger picture is <clears throat> have you looked at the ebird data and other data so does, uh, uh, citizen science data sets enough to know if there are regional variability in the United States. But I mean, the Northeast is a well-educated, uh, affluent area, and maybe a different part of the country has different human demographics and different bird results. A absolutely. So I mean, one of, the, one of the most astonishing things you can do is to just go explore on eBird and, and look at, um, I'll come back to the US and, and the Northeast in, in just a moment, but just look at any um, common widespread uh, Palearctic breeder that breeds across you know, temperate Eurasia. And they all show an extreme pattern where they're all through Western Europe, uh, Scandinavia, and then there's a line when you hit Russia, nobody uses eBird there. So, so all of these, these common uh, Palearctic species disappear from the, from the data set when you hit that political boundary. And that's, and, and you know, innumerable nuances to that. Um, in Britain, which has such a, a, a really uh, long and, and um, sophisticated birding history, they have other digital platforms for bird records. So eBird is actually in a fist fight there to, to um, win over users from other platforms. So uh, participation there and especially historical records in eBird are much deficient compared to some other countries. Other, India is an example of a country where there's been a great deal of buy-in to eBird. So there's a, a, the data quality is, is better. Um, but even within just, just our area in the Northeastern United States, it is absolutely striking how, how these, uh, these things work. Um, the number of checklists that are, are generated, the number of samples that are generated um, in places like Long Island and New York City, where there are a lot of, of, of birders um, and a lot of, uh, of really good birders, the, the scale of it is absolutely just night and day compared to upstate New York, for instance. Um, and Rhode Island is in between. It's, it's uh, got better coverage than parts of upstate New York, but much, much less than the New York City uh, um, area. And yet, the, these very, very fine scale variations in the way in which people 
uh, are, are sampling and um, recording their data, th th it's, um, it produces real, real interesting distortions. And so the, the best way I can describe it is the proportion of effort that is non-independent, that is sort of like people going to see the same bird in the New York City area is vastly greater than it is in upstate New York where there are almost no birders. Some people would say there are no birds. Um, and they, people are, are collecting data in a much more natural way with less of the, this, this pattern. So there's very fine scaled spatial variation in all of the biases that I was just describing. And I've got data to, to illustrate this. Mm -hmm. And not only um, from place to place, but over time. As people's habits are changing year by year, the the um, the, the patterns of, of people uh, how people record their data, the the du average duration of a checklist, the um, the average distance of a traveling checklist, the the these these parameters are changing over time, even in a given place, and so it, it results in a lot of um, a lot of difficulties for. Uh, um, actually doing quantitative analyses of the of the of the data. Right, that's that's really interesting. So, um, well, are there any other questions? Um, this is this has been. Uh, I'll, I'll give everybody a ollie ollie income free on the on the text questions, and um, this is absolutely fascinating. I I um, it makes me think about our BioBlitz data, which. We know have all kinds of you know biases and and uh, lacunae and uh, but still have lots of interesting things sort of buried in them and I I really think it's interesting to see what happens when you dig into a data set that a citizen science data set like this and and that and that there's lots of interesting things there to see. Um, uh, so one one other question: Are there efforts? at using AI to collect bird data? That's an interesting question. Well, um, I, being very, like a bit of a curmudgeon, I, I, I'm not uh, involved in things along those, those lines, but, I, but I'm aware of it. And oh. um, well, th there are two things um, going on. One, I don't know if it's actually um, AI, but there's a lot of, of, a lot of um, sort of passive detection, not using human observers, um, using uh, microphones for nocturnal flight calls of, of birds and obviously having us um, birds with uh, transmitters uh, um, uh, uploading data on their locations and, and, uh, and movements um, to, to satellites and, and other kinds of uh, sensors. That's a, a, a major source of, of, uh, of, of information for, for sure. Um, but the AI question comes up with um, increasingly um, newer people are being uh, uh, recruited into natural history observation and being given um, sort of apps uh, that will identify their samples for them, like a photograph of a flower or a photograph of a salamander or a bird. And those things are using AI for sure to learn the uh, patterns of errors that, that, that um, you know, the best way to, to maximize the, the, uh, the accuracy of, a, of a, um, you know, a, a, an automated identification uh, process. And then finally, another application of it is in, in terms of trying to, um, you know, I, I, I love to tell that story about the, uh, the gray-headed gull and which uh, Doug Gottschfeld, you know, was in his sleeping bag in the New Hampshire woods or whatever, looking at Brooklyn uh, um, rare bird records on his phone, um, you, you know, to, to really figure out what is rare in a given context and therefore requires review and requires documentation is, is such a difficult question. And certainly um, people are using AI to shape really sophisticated algorithms to, to uh, detect what is normal for a place and what's what's unexpected in a in a given place but I, I still um, go back to uh, some of the, those uh, conclusions that I, I just came up with which was there's there's still is nothing as good as an experienced uh, um, human being who's 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 observed uh, things for a long time to recognize what truly it does stand out in a particular context 
um, uh, versus uh, versus something else. But you know, it, it will improve over time. There's no no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, the dis. Well, somebody else talking about the advantages about the changing the changing technology about the scopes and the oh, yeah. and the the tripods and the portability of of everything as well as cameras. I mean, I. I'm more of an insect person myself, but the difference between film cameras and digital cameras when you're trying to photograph insects is night and day in the field yeah. is night and day. So it must be making a big difference. The, yeah, the the equipment is is night and day. Real, it, uh, there's no no doubt about it, and um, it, things are a lot easier than than they used to be. I, I think you know one of the the least appreciated uh, things is the tripod technology, where uh, it used to be until um, relatively recently that it was almost, it was very difficult to track flying birds with the, the tripod heads that were available until about 30, 35 years ago. Um, so that, that really revolutionized sea watching and, and um, a, a certain kinds of, uh, of, of effort. Um, but the, the photography is a game changing technology. There's, the, there's uh, simply no doubt about it. In fact, um, in certain contexts, it really has uh, taken over to the point where it's, you know, shoot first, identify later. And this is true yeah, even yeah. among the most highly skilled uh, pelagic birders. They'll, they'll go out and, um, you know, do a, um, a, a survey uh, in, in, in some uh, part of the ocean, and they're seeing all the, these uh, seabirds, and they're trying to uh, distinguish cryptic populations that may be species. And they really don't even try to look at the birds. They, they really just try to photograph them as well as they can and then sort them out by, by, um, you know, by position and, and date and, and so on and, and uh, analyze mm. the data later. Um, and, and so all of that is very exciting. I mean, a lot of my, my interest um, recently is in watching visible migration so I, I watch nocturnal migrants as they reorient in the morning at the at the outer beach. And um, this fall, we were discussing this as people were entering from the waiting room. It has been a a, fan, a, a very large uh, eruption year for many species of finches. So these diurnal migrants are sweeping along the outer beaches, and and we're we're um, seeing evening grosbeaks for the first time in in 25 years. Thing, things like that. Um, a lot of my young colleagues. Um, and we do it in a in a in a very um, sort of a complementary way and a and a uh, as a team. Most of us are are watching to get on the bird and detect the birds as they're as they're flying through. But um, some of the the them will uh, will shoot them as they're flying by, get the get the digital image, and we can therefore ground truth what we are doing. I mean, you get pretty good at identifying a lot of these things in 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 flight, but it is good to have the documentation. As mm -hmm. as uh, as well, so that's really really changed uh, changed things a lot. But so do you do you uh, do you record four hours of identification back home on your computer in your effort calculation? Uh, you... So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll do it. Um, you know, you know, sometimes I'll break it out by hours or 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 things like that. But uh, um, yeah, I, I I record it in as much detail as I can, and. The, you know, just to, to tie things together a little bit, um, one of the, the things that I fear uh, coming from, from this enhanced technical ability to identify birds without skill, without, without experience and, and, uh, and, and so on, is that ultimately if, if all you need to do is, is, you know, put a microphone up against the sky or uh, have a, have a um, you know, cameras uh, sampling a, a unit of airspace and, and things like this, and, and then uh, artificial intelligence identifying the, the data that, that's, uh, that's coming in, is that you really are losing the, the, the thing that makes it fun and makes it interesting and makes people engaged with the, the, the natural environment. Well, all of us got to it from a point of being fascinated by the organisms and wanting to understand them. And I really argue always that the, the techniques that I'm advocating here, first and foremost, 
It's not that it will improve the data for the quote unquote uh, scientists to be able to, to figure out what's going on with, with population trends, is it will help you understand what you're seeing better. If, if you think about the way in which you record the data, your own records will be more meaningful to you and you will appreciate the excitement of seeing what you know. Like the, the day that I finally see a Mississippi kite uh, um, in, in Suffolk County, it will be very meaningful to me, more so than, than I think um, a new bird is um, for, for uh, folks who are too caught up in, in just you know, uh, everything counts one kind of a, 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 a approach to, to their to their field effort. Right. Well, that, that's just terrific. Uh, a great way to wrap it up, and um, and uh, something that I think is is a suitable uh, talk for the awarding of the Distinguished Naturalist Awards to three remarkable birders uh, in Rhode Island and. Um, so I'll, I'll just say uh, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have like an applause yeah. soundtrack that I can play here, but um, you can imagine applause. And um, so let me just say to everybody who's still on the line, and it's actually quite a lot of people, you've managed to hold the audience pretty well here. Um, we have been recording this, and so we will put it up on our YouTube channel. While you're at our YouTube channel, you can check out our Expeditions to Rhode Island uh, videos and the Distinguished Naturalist Award ceremony, which we taped and will go up as this week's hashtag Natural History Tuesday video. And um, thank everybody for, uh, for coming tonight. And we will, this worked great and we'll look forward to seeing everybody at another event soon. So. Thank you very much, everybody, and, and thank you, Shoei. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks, uh, um, and uh, uh, great to see all these names here. Have a, have a good night. Yeah, you too. Natural History Survey videos are made possible through the generous contributions of members and friends. Want to help us do more environmental science and conservation? Hit the like button. Share our videos with your circle. Subscribe or make a financial contribution on our website, ranhs.org, or through Patreon. Thanks, and see you out there. <laughs>